Yeah, thanks for that, uh, that uh, intro. Uh, what obviously I'm, I'm here to do tonight is to just talk about some current developments in temperature control logistics. Uh, but, so who are we? Um, we're not the R RHA, we're not the FTA, I get on very well with my, my colleagues uh, in both organisations, but we do specialise in the food and drink logistics sector. And we've, we have a wide range of members right the way across the whole of the food sector too. So unlike being generic, like RHA or FTA, we actually have members who are in retail, wholesale, food service, manufacturing and third party. And we even have one or two logistics distribution type activities attached to manufacturing. Samba Brothers, for example, a very good example of that. Um, we spend quite a lot of time, or I seem to, uh, talking to government. Uh, I suppose the government departments I particularly focus on are DEFRA, Food Standards Agency, uh, the Department of Transport, and DEC. And I'll talk about DEC and energy management and the environmental issues as well as we go through. Um, we have, if you like, a more worldwide uh, operation as well, and we work closely with academia and other trade bodies. But overall, as I say, the membership cover those particular areas, and I suppose we've, we've, we sort of pride ourselves that we actually understand food logistics in, in all aspects, or not far to fault, but certainly uh, manufacturing plant, abattoir, or wherever, right the way through to certainly the, the retail, RDC, and beyond. Our members, just to give you a few numbers, uh, I'll just go down the list, it won't take up too much time, um, are very much spread across the, uh, across the whole of the sector. Um, one of the things that we do do, and I'll, I'll point this one out, we have our four members across retail, food service and so on, manufacturing process. We also have members who are owners and operators of temperature control facilities because we operate the climate change agreement for the sector. That is how to get cash back from the treasury. Um, and it's quite simple if you're prepared to commit to reduce your energy consumption. It's a scheme which uh, came about as a result of Mr. Gordon Brown, you may remember him, uh, when he put the climate change levy on all electricity supplies in the UK. And there was a stream from the manufacturing sectors who are high energy users because it made them uncompetitive as against their European counterparts. And we had this, we, we then said that it also makes us uncompetitive in relation to the services that our members supply to food manufacturers where you've got off-site temperature control facilities. So over the course of the, the, the noughties in 2006, we managed to persuade the Treasury and the Cabinet Office that we should have a scheme too. And so far we have over 180, uh, 180 companies with over 350 temperature control facilities. But we have a fairly complex marketplace, as you'll know. Uh, currently the food industry is worth 16% of gross domestic product. That uh, depends on where you get the numbers from. That might be slightly skewed. Somebody may say it's like more, slightly less. That's, pretty, that's the sort of number that I've managed to research. Exports currently take about 10% of the total. But of course, this is the big issue, 45 to 50% of all our food, food supply comes from abroad. So, just as an example, because we're talking about temperature control, the current retail frozen food market is probably roughly worth, in the last uh, year, about 5.8 billion, uh, which is a, about Point, was it point more one percent down on the previous year, and the, and the food service and wholesale, of course, are probably around about the same level. And people sort of think about retail, but forget the substantial amount of volume that actually goes through food service in that sector. The areas of challenge, as I see it, very much people getting them. And if we've got forty-five thousand lorry drivers short, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Regulation, um, and we'll talk about the primary authority partnerships in a minute, which uh, 
we certainly have just signed up to. Um, the whole issue about food quality, supply chain, int integrity. Um, so we talk about the British, uh, the British Retail Consortium Global Standards for Storage and Distribution and, uh, and al allied matters. Obviously, technical changes in relation, quality assurance and certification, sustainability and environment. So people, vacancies and motivation and the need to make really for a five-year plan. Um, how many, I know I was talking to, um, I was talking earlier about people and recruitment. How many of you are really finding it difficult to, to, to actually recruit people? Across the board, at all levels? Do you fill on your graduate trainee posts? No, I doubt it. Do you, you certainly have got an issue about drivers, if you look at it from the other perspective, and how are we actually going to cope with that, bearing in mind, if we take the, 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 the information on coming, coming, that's coming across the pond, where they equally have a major issue to do with, to do with uh, driver, uh, driver supply, there you're seeing wage rates going, like, going up like that. And I don't know whether you're seeing that here and here in the UK, but I guess you are. Certainly the, the word in the street is that's a big problem. Health and safety, logistics is a very dangerous place. You were aware of that, I hope. We are actually, we have a, a, a quite disgraceful and terrible reputation and experience within our sector, particularly in relation to the use of forklift. Skills and tra training and skills. Uh, we in our federation are, uh, have developed uh, vocational qualifications from apprenticeship up to level three with business improvement techniques for supervisors. And that's a, that's a process which is relatively new and those companies who have piloted up to date have seen an incredible amount of, of uh, benefit to them. We have a plethora of regulations in our sector, and I've just put up, I suppose, probably some of the most important. I think of um, well, that's the old start of the ten. The food labelling regulations, the general food law, which these two are probably the most important uh, part of my life in servicing our members in terms of information about what the obligation is to, in, ge in general terms, in terms of food safety, food hygiene, and um, food law. The animal pie products uh, sector is all about meat, fresh meat. Uh, so anybody with cold stores, uh, with blast, blast freezers, chillers, or certainly at the top end of the of the, sort of, of, of the uh, food chain has to has to be well aware of what the obligations are by the way these three total around about 180 pages of close bit time so you've actually got to understand what they are as well the new food rep food information regulations which is very much more customer focused uh, probably won't won't, won't really uh, sort of affect too many of of us as logisticians, but it certainly will in terms of our supply chain colleagues and the buyers and the, and the people who influence what we do on a day-by-day -day basis. And finally, the new, this, this, the new approval for standalone cold store establishments is, a, is an offshoot of, the, of 854 2004. It's just coming in. We've then spent quite a lot of time getting some definitions in terms of where, how that actually works, and to which organisations and which locations that actually, that actually applies. Because it doesn't apply to retail. However, if you're a third party logistics service supplier, it may or may not apply to you depending on the circumstance. If you are Iceland, it won't apply to you. Because you're totally retail. If you are a, a contract distribution operation, 
we are saying three coal stores on the site. And one of them is dedicated to a major, a major retailer. You don't have to get that one approved. But if the other two are being used by a multiple of different operators or customers with their products on a more generalised basis, they will. So long as they've got products of animal origin, i.e. meat, fish, mollusks, and poultry and game and a whole range of other products. So if you want any more information about that, if that causes you any grief, let me know and I'll send you a select <coughs> QA type do document which may help you uh, clarify exactly whether or not you are or can't. Primary Authority Partnership we've covered briefly before. It's it's, uh, as I say, a government programme to reduce, reduce regulatory burden. The Better Regulation Delivery Office is the government department of biz uh, that uh, actually oversees the whole thing. And the, the real benefit of this, I mean, so we're going, we're going, we now have a coordinated partnership, we're registered with them. And the whole issue is all about uniform application of locally enforced regulation. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Newcastle or Newbury or wherever. If, you, if you're a member of a coordinated partnership of a PAP and if somebody comes into your business and, uh, from local authority, the first thing you do is say, by the way, I'm a PAP, this one out. And the chances are the whole thing will change and the local person will actually withdraw and leave it. They will obviously report it to Slough if there's a particular issue that they have to pick up, but they will actually deal with that um, on, uh, from a slab perspective, therefore producing a uniform, uh, uniform enforcement of the regulation. <coughs> Who's got R22? I hope nobody has. It was probably the best refrigerant of its type was banned uh, around about five years ago and should now be no longer in use. And we know that there are a significant number of old stores, children's stores, um, and distribution centres which still have it. You can't touch it unless you're actually going to destroy the product, the, the actual R22 refrigerant, because it's illegal to do so. It's all to do with um, uh, ozone layer. The effect on the ozone layer. The F gas regulations came into force uh, on the 1st of January after about 12 months worth of review in Brussels, uh, and that is very much a, a phase down of refrigerants such as R404A. And the other thing is, of course, is it also includes mobile. So if your truck fridges have got a little sign on them saying R134A, you've got them. Not immediately. But go and talk to your local Thermokin carrier uh, engineer and say, what are you going to do about it? Because within <coughs> the next three years, the cost of that refrigerant will, already, will go up exponentially. <coughs> We've already seen 404A, and bear in mind we're nine months down the track of a 15-year uh, phase-down period. We're already seeing the price of 404A, which is predominant refrigerant go up probably by about four times. There's no business aid can afford that. And secondly, you really ought to be talking to your refrigeration specialists, your engineers, to say what you're going to do about it, what's your recommendation. What it also has generated are some explosive alter alternatives like propane and methane and some of those other uh, products which are very good at highly efficient uh, refrigerants, they go bad. Um, and some of the stuff that's being produced, particularly in the mobile sector, HFOs, right, hydrofluorooleans, right, are also mildly explosive, which means that they fall into the ATEX, that's the European bit, our DESIRE regulation, the Dangerous Substances and Explosive Atmospheres Regulations 2002, which means you've got a whole new board, as indeed 
does an own. And if you want to hear more about that, we're holding an ammonia summit in Doncaster uh, in, in October. And this is the big issue, I suppose. How do we attract the people we need? I mean, obviously the RHA and the FTA, and along with the CILT UK and the Institute of Road Transport Engineers <coughs> joined forces to, to say, well, you know, how do we actually market opportunities within our sector? And that's still a question, work in progress. And who will train? Who will train the young entrants we need as well? We, we keep on hearing, I, I listened to Beverly Bell, the new president, uh, at her inaugural address, you know, going, sort of repeating the same old excuse which this industry has used for the last 40 years because I've been in it that long ago. Um, you know, oh well, if I train somebody, he'll go down the road for another five pounds a week and I'll have wasted all my money. And I think that's the biggest falsehood I've heard over and over again. But it keeps coming up. Uh, I think particularly from the smaller end of the market. The, the sort of the, the owner operator, the small fleet operator, and so on. Unless you're really enlightened. And I mean, I know, you know DHL, for example, um, you know, Pierre de Cartre and, and his team, and Norbert, I'm sorry, XPO, and uh, the, the big boys, are very, Winkhampton and so on, are very much into that because they, they believe in training not only for itself, but also for the benefits that it actually produces for their business. But, that, I don't think it's going to be enough. That's it. I hope that was useful. I hope that was helpful. I hope that illuminated various sectors. You didn't get a lot of detail uh, in terms of your know, systems and all the other stuff. That's for somebody else. But I thought I'd just give you an overview of how I see the food supply chain and food food logistics in a wider, wider view of picking up one or two of the current issues, particularly on the technical, technical and operational side.